All right, welcome everyone to this week's installment of the CMV web series. Um, before we begin, just a few reminders. First, please take a moment to fill out today's attendance survey. Um, this information is actually really important to us as we try to document the reach of this web series. And it's also an important variable in our pre and post series CMV evaluation projects, which some of you are participating in. So please do take a moment and just let us know that you were here. You can either open up the camera on your phone and focus on this, it should take you to a URL, or you can type in the URL here at the bottom. Either way, you will get to that survey. If you're watching this later on YouTube, um, we'd like you to fill it out as well. So please um, use the URL or QR code to record your attendance too. I'd also like to remind you of the process for asking questions. So please be sure to type your questions into the Q&A box and not the chat. Um, Zoom helps us keep a log of all the questions that are asked through Q&A but doesn't record any questions that come through via chat. And this is helpful in case we're not able to get to your question on the call. The log allows us to see what was asked and by whom so we can follow up. And along those lines, if you know you're not signed in using your full name, please include your name along with your question so we can follow up with you if we need to. Because we're recording this, you are all on mute, but Erica Anderson is on the, is manning the Q&A today, and she will read me your questions at the end, time permitting. Um, if your question is something that she can just type an answer to you, um, she will do that. Um, we will also, again, have time for questions we don't get to live on our Q&A webinar, which is on March 12th. With that, we can go ahead and get started with today's presentation, which will be focusing on how to identify and assess case level data, a large portion of category four in the scoring metrics. If you've reached category four, you know that your CMV contains protein coding elements from category one, but is not known to overlap any known dosage sensitive or benign genes or genomic regions from category two. At this point, you need to assess whether there's any evidence to suggest that the region itself, or at least one gene therein, causes disease in a dosage-dependent manner. For losses, ask yourself, is there evidence that loss of this gene or genomic region causes a consistent phenotype? For whole genes or multigenic gains, is there evidence that extra copies of this gene or genomic region causes a consistent phenotype? Remember that when you're dealing with intragenic duplication, they may be acting as loss of functions. So first, start with a search for any evidence available on the region as a whole. I typically start with a quick literature search by cytoband, starting with the most specific information I have. So for example, 10Q11.22 to Q11.23, then moving back a layer from there to ensure I'm not missing anything. If my first search comes up with nothing, I might try then both 10Q11.22 uh, and 10Q11.23. Then I might move back to 10Q11, realizing that, of course, the broader I go with my search, the more likely I'll be to find something that may be irrelevant to my case in terms of overlapping gene content. A broad search like this might not be useful, for example, if your CMV is in the same general vicinity as other well-studied CMVs. So if you search for something like 22Q11, you might include numerous results for 22Q11.2 deletions, even though this isn't necessarily what you are interested in. To quickly identify regions like this that might be more well-studied than others, the ClinGen Recurrent Regions track that Erica mentioned last week can be a good resource. The information on that track will let you know that ClinGen has curated this region at some point in time, even if it did not have enough evidence to be considered established. In all, despite the fact that this type of search will at times bring irrelevant results, I still find that a quick region search can be useful to just get a sense for what's known or not known about the region, as well as to make sure my focus isn't too narrow. Had I immediately jumped to just looking at individual genes in the region on the previous slide, I might have missed the publications discussing regions very similar in content to the CMV under evaluation. Further, historically, large multigenic losses that might be relevant to your case may have been reported before a specific gene of interest had been identified or while evidence for a particular single gene was accumulating. When looking for evidence to support your CMV, which other CMVs are appropriate to consider? Say your CMV is the one at the top of the stripes, encompassing genes one through four. 
CMVs 2 through 8 are all near your CMV, overlap variably with both the genes in the region and with each other. In general, with no additional information, CMVs 2 and 8 could be dismissed from consideration. They don't overlap the same genes as your CMV does. However, there may, of course, be reasons that you consider keeping them in. Perhaps your maximum CMV interval includes some of those genes, for example. CMV3 would be a strong contender for consideration. Though it's smaller than your CMV, it's highly similar in terms of genomic content, including all four of the same genes. The other CMVs, 4 through 7, are possible. They each overlap some, but not all, of your CMV's genes. At this point in the evidence search, it becomes helpful to determine if there is a gene of interest. Has the causative gene been proposed? Which gene or genes are involved in the minimal region of overlap? If we had evidence to suggest that gene 2, for example, was the gene of interest, we might become more interested in CMVs 3, 5, and 7, the ones that contain that gene. CMVs 4 and 6 become less interesting in this scenario, depending, of course, on the degree of certainty that you have that gene 2 is truly the gene of interest. You might choose to keep them under consideration, for example, if all the CMVs in the region share a unique phenotype, such as maybe a limb malformation or something like that, despite the fact that their gene content is different. Similarly, if gene 4 was actually the gene of interest, our focus might shift to CMVs 3, 4, and 6. And the same caveats we just discussed would now apply to CMVs 5 and 7. Having some idea of which gene might have the most supportive evidence and that you might want to take through the rest of the evalu evaluation process will help you identify which larger cases, if any, may be appropriate to include. If there's no compelling region level evidence or not enough region level evidence to get you all the way up to pathogenic, the next step is to look into the individual genes within the CMV. So where to begin with that? Did your region search point you toward a gene of interest? If so, consider starting there. Other things to consider from highest potential for relevant information to least include, uh, were there any genes in the region evaluated by ClinGen dosage sensitivity but not given the score of three? Are there any omen morbid genes? Any genes with compelling haploinsufficiency predictor data for losses? Any omen genes? Or any other relevant clinical literature? So let's walk through this process, assuming we have a deletion of the following region on chromosome 22 in GRCH37. One place that I like to start is decipher. You can put in your coordinates here, and on the very last tab of your results, which is called genes, the one that's highlighted in blue at the top. Um, they provide you with a nice table of genes where you can sort or filter by a number of different parameters. In addition to being able to tell you how many protein coding genes are in the region, information that you need for category three, it lists whether each gene um, is found in OMIM or is OMIM morbid or classified as a disease gene by their DDG2P project. It also provides the decipher haploinsufficiency index and the PLI score, which comes from exact at this time. Here, I'm drawing your attention to the OMIM morbid column. You can click the top of each column to sort the table by that column. I've clicked so that all three genes in the interval that are OMIM morbid are displayed at the top. These genes typically have the most potential for useful evidence. Now, just because there are OMIM morbid genes in the region does not necessarily mean that the CMV should be classified as pathogenic or that those genes are even appropriate for continued evaluation. You need to consider both the mode of inheritance and the disease mechanism. When assessing the mode of inheritance, particularly if your variant has been identified on microarray or you know that the variant is heterozygous, give precedence to those genes that are associated with autosomal dominant disorders caused by the appropriate mutational mechanism. In our example, we identified three OMIM morbid genes. One of them, TCN2, is associated with an autosomal recessive disease. We may choose to comment on the potential carrier status for transcobalamin type 2 deficiency in the report, but for the purposes of our scoring metrics, we're going to focus on the two autosomal dominant genes. So next, let's take a look at their reported disease mechanism. So it may not always be immediately obvious from the OMIM description of a gene or condition what the disease mechanism is. Sometimes it might not even be known. One way to get a sense of what it may be is by looking at the reported allelic variant. 
Here, I'm showing table views of the allelic variants reported in OMIM for MORC2 and DEPDC5. The DEPDC5 table lists multiple putative loss of function variants, while the MORC2 table lists three missense variants. This suggests that DEPDC5 gene may have more evidence to evaluate in terms of how loss might affect this particular gene. Of course, the variants listed in OMEM are not necessarily the only variants associated with a particular gene or disease and may not necessarily be pathogenic, but they are a good place to start um, and jumpstart your evidence search. Another potential place to look for high-level information is the clinicalgenome.org website. In this particular example, a gene disease validity curation has been performed for DEPDC5, but not for MORC2. If we look at the DEPDC5 curation, we see that the ClinGen Epilepsy Gene Curation Expert Panel has noted within their review that haploin sufficiency appears to be the mechanism for disease for this particular gene. For the purposes of our evaluation, we could start with DEPDC5 for the evidence to support the overall classification, but we could also potentially look further into the mechanisms associated with MORC2 and TCN2. If there's any reason to suspect haploinsufficiency for either of those two, this may be something worth commenting on in the clinical report. And we'll discuss this reporting in more detail on March 5th. So what would we do if our region had no omen morbid genes? Well, we'd continue to run down the triage list of gene properties to prioritize. Uh, we have no congen dosage genes, no omen morbid genes. Do we have any predicted haploinsufficiency genes for losses? Do we have any genes that are simply documented in OMIM? Um, do quick literature searches at each of these stages. This time, start broad and then add specifics if the results are too numerous to assess. So for example, I typically start a, my search with just the gene name only, um, though you may consider including any aliases if your gene is known to have them. Um, if that type of search returns only a few hits, then great, I'll look at each title and abstract to determine if any are relevant. If that search returns too many results for me to realistically look at, you know, so beyond the first page or so, I'll start narrowing the search. When evaluating losses, consider searches like um, gene name and loss of function, or gene name and haploid sufficiency, or gene name and deletion. Um, when you're looking at gains, you might consider searches like gene name and duplication, realizing that you may get some small intragenic duplications that might actually be acting as loss of functions, so read those carefully, and maybe gene name and triplet sensitivity. Um, for any type of search, you might also consider doing gene name and disease name if you know it. Um, again, I review the titles and the abstracts and start picking out potentially relevant articles from there, repeating as necessary. Now, must you do this for every single gene in the interval? No, not necessarily. If you have a large CMV with many, many genes, you might be able to reach likely pathogenic based on this fact alone, utilizing category three. If that's your scenario, then you're truly just looking for which genes, if any, should be called out on the report. Genes that are associated with known disease risk in accordance with the appropriate mode of inheritance and mechanism for your variant. Um, but if your CMV has a small manageable number of genes, a complete search may be more feasible. You're really just trying to make sure to the extent possible that you're not missing any substantial disease association information. Once you've identified your gene of interest, start collecting any case-based evidence using category four. Again, for losses, you're looking for evidence that loss of function of this particular gene results in a disease. Appropriate evidence in this case might include whole gene deletions, including only that gene or similar in gene content to your CMV, if appropriate, intragenic deletions predicted to undergo nonsense mediated decay, other putative loss of function sequence variants predicted to undergo nonsense mediated decay, or missense variants if and only if there is strong functional evidence indicating loss of function. For gains, appropriate evidence may include duplications of the entire gene, or again, similar in gene content to your CMV as appropriate. Do not count intragenic duplications as evidence on the gain scoring metrics as they might be acting as loss of function. And additionally, do not count gain of function missense variants as this is a different disease mechanism. The primary source of your evidence should be peer-reviewed scientific literature. Why? 
Well, the literature typically, though of course not always, provides a narrative with sufficient evidence to independently assess the case. This information is to an extent accessible to others so they can verify your assessment if need be. Finally, the peer review process lends some credibility to the evidence. Other sources of case-based data may include public databases or your own internal laboratory database. While cases from public databases certainly are easily accessible by others, they often don't provide sufficient evidence for you to be able to independently evaluate their claim, such as phenotype on the patient, inheritance information, information on other potentially causative variants, um, the extent of previous testing, the rationale behind their classification, if there is one, et cetera. If you do decide to utilize a case from a public database, please note any available identifiers and the date the case was accessed in order to help others trying to follow your evidence. Internal laboratory databases are very helpful in that they readily provide you with information from your own lab's experience, but they are not easily accessed by others who may want to validate your claim. If you do use this type of information, please describe it thoroughly so that others, again, can follow your logic and consider submitting the information to a public database. Be aware of any potential sources of bias within your internal database, such as platform-specific artifacts, population sampling bias, et cetera. In general, the case-level scoring categories differ by phenotype, phenotype specificity and inheritance. In terms of phenotype, highly specific, well-defined phenotypes constitute stronger evidence than nonspecific phenotypes, which constitutes stronger evidence than disparate phenotypes. The more nonspecific your phenotype, the less certain you can be that it is caused by your gene or region of interest and not other genes or even other non-genetic factors. In terms of inheritance, de novo information and or strong segregation information is generally stronger evidence than variants with unknown inheritance. Knowing how a variant segregates or doesn't in a family can provide valuable information when trying to assess its potential role in disease. Many of the evidence types within Section 4 are associated with scoring ranges, and this is because some pieces of evidence are stronger than others, even within the same general category. The ranges provide the flexibility needed to accommodate this. So, for example, consider upgrading the score for a particular piece of case-level evidence if functional evidence is available to demonstrate that the variant is acting as either loss of function or triplosensitive, as opposed to its functional consequences just being assumed. You might choose to upgrade if you know that other potential causes of a phenotype have been ruled out. So, for example, a particular biochemical finding is known to be caused by, say, three specific genes. All three were sequenced, and a causative variant was found in only one. Note that most of the ranges do include zero, and this is just to reinforce the idea that just because a piece of evidence is available does not mean that you are required to give it the default score. So to illustrate this concept, think about a de novo loss of function variant identified in an individual with something like um, early onset epileptic encephalopathy reported in the literature. However, you check the variant in a population database and you see the frequency is incredibly high, too high to make sense for this particular disorder. Should you go ahead and give it the default number of points anyway, just because it is a de novo variant? No. This is a scenario where it would be appropriate to assign zero points. Other times you might consider downgrading or not scoring include um, when other potential causes of the phenotype have not effectively been ruled out. So for example, your variant was found on single gene sequencing and no other testing was reported. Um, if there's any reason to believe that your variant is not acting as loss of function or triplosensitive, so maybe a nonsense variant in the last exon not expected to undergo nonsense mediated decay. Um, if your variant is present at a frequency inconsistent with the disease in the general population, that's what we just talked about, or if the variant type is common in the general population. And to illustrate that last scenario, say you were able to collect a number of putative loss function variants to support the claim that losses of the Zwilch gene cause a neurodevelopmental phenotype. However, when you look at this gene in NOMAD, you see that the gene is not constrained for loss of function variants. There appear to be numerous population loss function variants distributed throughout the gene within the coding exons. Um, 
with this many uh, loss of function variants in the general population, this might cause you to question whether the variants you found in the cases were truly causative or if they occurred by chance. This might be a scenario where you consider downgrading. When evaluating variants from the literature and trying to decide whether or not they would be appropriate supportive evidence for your CMV, check their frequencies in population data resources such as NOMAD. This is particularly important if the paper was published before the wide availability of such resources. So just because the variant was absent in the 200 control chromosomes or whatever they evaluate at the time, doesn't mean it's not absent in the large data sets that we have available today. So always good to double check. If a variant that you are evaluating does happen to be a NOMAD, this is not necessarily an automatic rule out. Think carefully about whether or not the frequency you're observing makes sense in the context of your phenotype. Does the variant frequency make sense in terms of the prevalence of your disorder? Is your disorder common or rare? Is it your phenotype adult onset or childhood onset? Is it severe? Is this something that could be easily missed? Ultimately, what you're trying to think about is, would it make sense for somebody with this phenotype um, to be approached, uh, to be recruited as a case or a control for a study focused on common conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera? So this is the type of studies that we see in these population databases for the most part. If your phenotype is, is something like, you know, short stature in the setting of normal development, then it might make complete sense that somebody with a variant in your gene and short stature might be approached to be in one of these studies. If your phenotype was something like profound intellectual disability, however, that might make less sense. If you are dealing with disorders for which the prevalence is known or can be reasonably approximated, um, and you have some idea about the genetic heterogeneity and penetrance of the condition, you can use this calculator to help you figure out what an appropriate frequency threshold for ruling out variants might be, and the URL is at the top. The first evidence type within category four is for de novo variants. You'll notice that this is broken down by phenotype, highly specific and relatively unique, highly specific but not necessarily unique, and nonspecific and or with high genetic heterogeneity. These categories correspond to recommendations put forth by the ClinGen Sequence Variant Interpretation Working Group for how to evaluate the PS2, PM6 sequence variant criteria describing de novo variation. Briefly, the first category, highly specific and relatively unique, is the strongest type of evidence. Reserve this category for diseases with pathognomonic features or features that are highly unusual in the general population and associated with a single or a very small handful of genes. So some examples of this might include thick dilated pupils in Gillespie syndrome, um, fetal adrenal cortical cytomegaly and Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, lip pits and van der Waals syndrome, Kaiser Fleischer rings and Wilson syndrome, et cetera. This category could also be considered in scenarios where a biochemical abnormal or abnormality clearly points you toward a gene in question, or if it suggests one of a few genes, the others have been ruled out. So an example of this could be something like um, increased heparin sulfate only on urinary glycosamine or glycan analysis suggests the diagnosis of MPS type 3 or Sam Filippo syndrome, which is a condition that is caused by four different genes. If the other three genes have been analyzed and no variants found, you can be reasonably certain that the fourth gene is the correct gene to look for in this case. The second category, specific but not necessarily unique, is most appropriate for those conditions which are not particularly common in the general population, but that can be associated with a number of different genetic causes, such that you don't have the same degree of certainty as in the last category that you're dealing with the correct gene. So for example, something like leukodystrophy, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation. This is a very specific presentation, but it's associated with multiple different genetic condi conditions. Um, same with certain dysmorphic features, such as metopic ridging, which we talked about um, a few weeks ago. The third category, and likely the category that you will use most frequently, is the not highly specific and or high genetic heterogeneity category. This category is for those presentations that don't necessarily clue you in to any specific genetic condition because they are features of so many. Um, these types of conditions may be more common than other genetic conditions and may be caused or exacerbated by non-genetic factors. 
The poster children for this category are neurodevelopmental disorders, such as developmental delay, autism, intellectual disability. In most cases, phenotypes involving those presentations should be scored in this category. However, it is appropriate to consider the higher categories when the neurodevelopmental presentation is paired with some additional, more specific features. For example, loss of the MAOA gene on the X chromosome is associated with Brunner syndrome, which is characterized by intellectual disability and aggressive behaviors. Uh, those findings alone are not particularly specific and could describe a number of different genetic conditions. However, Brunner syndrome is also associated with some distinct measurable laboratory abnormalities, such as increased serotonin and urinary metanephrine. This unique feature makes the syndrome appropriate to score in the highest category. The proper phenotypic category can be difficult to determine at the outset, and there's really at this time, there's no specific number of OMIM associations, for example, that I could give you at this time to differentiate between the three categories. However, if you are ever in any doubt, going with the most conservative option is the best approach. You'll also notice that there are two default scores for each de novo category, one for assumed and one for confirmed de novo status. This is consistent with the recommendations made in the sequence variant interpretation guidelines, Richards et al., that increased weight be given in scenarios where both parental relationships have been confirmed. Parental relationships are confirmed when additional testing is done to confirm that both parents, the mom and the dad, are indeed the biological parents. If such testing has not been done, then de novo status is assumed. When assessing X-linked variants in XY males, only maternity needs to be confirmed. And if the variant was identified by trio-based exome or genome sequencing, parental relationships can be considered confirmed. If, however, the paper specifies that exome or genome was done on the proband only with Sanger confirmation of the variant in the parents, that's de novo, this is not the same thing. The parental relationships are still assumed in that scenario. If the authors don't specify or if you're in any doubt, again, always go with the most conservative option. So what do you do if you're looking at evidence supporting your observed CMV and the phenotypes are varied and inconsistent? In this scenario, you need to consider whether this truly represents anti-evidence and warrants negative points, or if it simply represents a lack of information, too little information to make an informed assessment and warrants zero points. Consider the following example. In the first scenario, say you find a de novo deletion of a particular gene reported only twice in the literature, once in a seven-year-old with developmental delay and once in a newborn with a congenital anomaly. Depending on the information available, you might choose to score this scenario at zero points. It's unknown whether the newborn will go on to exhibit developmental delays, and it's unknown whether the older child was evaluated for the congenital anomaly. In the second example, say the deletion was now reported five times, all in older, well-phenotyped individuals, an adult with intellectual disability, an adult with a history of cardiac defect and normal development, an adult with a history of genitourinary anomalies and normal development, and two general population individuals. In this scenario, we might feel more confident saying that these presentations seem disparate enough to warrant negative points. Category 4E may be used with the inheritance for a when the inheritance for a particular variant is unknown. In general, this should only be used for more specific phenotypes, specifically variants identified in the setting of nonspecific phenotypes like intellectual disability and autism with no inheritance information should not be counted as evidence. In other scenarios, however, it may be more prudent to count variants without inheritance information. So for example, um, adult onset conditions where parental testing may be particularly difficult um, and testing has been otherwise comprehensive. Segregation of a variant among similarly affected family members can lend support to the argument that the variant may be disease causing. It's important to remember that segregation implicates a locus and not necessarily a particular gene or variant. And while a given variant may be segregating within a family, it might also be in linkage disequilibrium with the true causative variant. We recommend a conservative approach with at least three documented segregations among affected individuals in order to award points per the scoring metric. Um, in order to simplify the process of assessing this type of evidence and in the interest of being conservative, only those individuals with both the genotype and the phenotype or individuals that are obligate carriers by virtue of their position in the pedigree should be counted as evidence towards segregation. 
Again, the number of segregations and suggested points serve as a guide. Consider awarding fewer than the suggested number of points if the variant was observed via candidate gene sequencing only, as opposed to other genome-wide assessments such as exome sequencing. To illustrate how segregations might be counted in a family, consider the following example, which incidentally comes from our ClinGen Gene Curation Standard Operating Procedures document. This is the pedigree of a family with autosomal dominant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In general, the number of segregations is going to be the number of affected individuals minus one, the proband. To be conservative, we're only counting genotype positive, phenotype positive individuals, such as 2,6 and oligate carriers such as 2-2. What about individuals such as 3-2 or 3-5 who are genotype positive, phenotype negative? Well, in this particular phenotype, we know that it's associated with reduced and age-dependent penetrance. So genotype positive, phenotype negative individuals are not unexpected here. We're just simply not gonna account for them in our segregation scoring. However, if this was a different phenotype, something that was associated with complete penetrance, this type of information could cause you to discount the entire pedigree. The bottom line here is, is know your phenotype. Here's another example, this time, of an X-linked pedigree. X-linked pedigrees need to be evaluated carefully. Depending on the condition, female carriers are typically, but of course not always, expected to be phenotype negative, regardless of their genotype status. An X-linked pedigree with a large number of female genotype positive individuals could potentially inflate the segregation scoring. In these scenarios, consider only counting those females directly linking the affected males. In this scenario, even though there are nine genotype positive females in the family, we're only counting the ones linking the two affected males, the proband's mother, 3-9, and her genotype positive mother, 2-4. We're counting the proband's great-grandmother, 1-2, even though she was not tested and had no affected sons herself, because she did have two genotype positive daughters and is the linking relative between the two affected branches of the family. From there, we're counting um, genotype positive individual 2-2, her genotype positive daughter 35, and her affected genotype positive son 41 for a total of six segregations. Instances in which the variant appears not to segregate with affected status must be interpreted with caution. Apparent non segregations include instances in which another affected individual in the family is found not to have the variant, that's category 4i. Um, and instances in which an unaffected individual is found, to ha is found to have the variant. That's categories 4, J, and K, which differ by specificity of the phenotype. To evaluate what these scenarios may mean for your evidence evaluation, you need to know your phenotype. Is there a plausible explanation why this phenotype might not be present, observed, or reported? Such reasons may include um, known reduced penetrance, known age-related penetrance. Um, the phenotype is not readily observable. The phenotype has not been properly evaluated or variable expressivity. Conversely, could there be a reason why the phenotype is appearing in someone without the variant? Does this disorder have known phenocopies? This may be more likely to occur in the setting of disorders that may be more common in the general population, for example, breast cancer and or disorders that are known to have both genetic and non-genetic causes, for example, cardiomyopathy. Consider downgrading this evidence when phenocopies are a possibility. The specificity of the phenotype plays a role in how confident you can be in a family member's quote-unquote unaffected status, and the recommended point values vary accordingly. For example, um, if the phenotype under example is specific and well-defined, such as a rare eye phenotype that you can only detect with a dilated eye exam. If the family member was evaluated by an ophthalmologist, did have that dilated eye exam, and was found not to have that eye phenotype, then you can feel comfortable awarding the default number of negative points. If the family member was evaluated by a general practitioner, and they did not say whether the person had a dilated eye exam, you might consider downgrading that. In that scenario, zero points might be appropriate if we can't know if the dilated eye exam was performed. So there would be no way to know if this individual was truly unaffected or not without that study. 
Now think about a less specific phenotype such as autism spectrum disorder. If the family member was thoroughly evaluated, maybe by a developmental pediatrician using validated measures of cognitive and social development and said to be unaffected, then you might feel comfortable awarding the default number of negative points. However, you might consider downgrading or not awarding any negative points at all if that family member was just said to be stated in the publication not to be affected and no details of their evaluation were provided. Where does the case that's currently in front of you fit in? One misunderstanding that we've encountered with these technical standards is that the recommendation to uncouple the clinical classification of a variant from the clinical significance to the patient under study means that we don't account for the patient's phenotype in our evaluation process. That's not the case. To clarify, we're saying that your patient's phenotype should not be the sole arbiter of the classification of your variant and should not necessarily override any other evidence supporting or refuting your variant. The case in front of you should be treated just as any other case and scored accordingly. And this can be done using category five as shown here. In general, if your case is de novo, assign it the same number of points you would have a de novo literature case in category four. If your case is inherited, assign positive points as you would in category four if the variant segregates with the phenotype and consider whether to assign zero or negative points if your case represents an apparent non-segregation in light of the caveats we just discussed. You may notice that categories 5S through 5H deal with various scenarios when the inheritance information for your patient is either unavailable or uninformative. Hopefully the concept of unavailable is self-explanatory, but what do we mean when we say uninformative? With this, we're referring to situations where testing may only be available on one parent, and that parent doesn't carry the variant. And while this is certainly additional information, it still doesn't tell us whether the variant is de novo or inherited and is thus uninformative. In this instance, it might still be appropriate to assign positive points to your case if their reported phenotype is consistent with what has been described in similar cases in accordance with the specificity of that phenotype. As we mentioned earlier, you are certainly not obligated to assign any positive points to your case if the situation warrants. For example, if you don't feel like you have enough information to accurately determine your case's phenotype and whether or not it's consistent with the others, um, that might be an example where you don't award any points. We'll discuss this concept further in our example case. Um, but before we get into our example case, I'll just pause for a moment and once again acknowledge all the members of our team and, of course, remind you to, again, fill out today's attendance survey. Um, with that, we'll walk through an example that focuses heavily on case-level data scoring, a duplication at 5Q23.3 in an adult male with gait abnormality. So here's what we know about this case. Again, this is a duplication at 5Q23.2, identified in a 45-year-old male referred for gait abnormalities. Parents are deceased, so inheritance information is unknown, but the patient does report that his father had a history of ataxia and tremor. For this CMV, we're going to use the gain scoring metrics. First up is the initial assessment of genomic content. Our case, which I will refer to as case W, is represented at the top of this screenshot from the UCSC genome browser. You can see that this duplication does involve protein coding genes, so we'll apply category 1A, which is worth zero points, and continue our evaluation. Um, next, we would assess whether this duplication involves any established triplet-sensitive, haploinsufficient, or benign genes or genomic regions using category 2. In this case, we can see that our duplication does indeed involve an established triplet-sensitive gene, LMNB1. At this point, in a real case, this would lead you to a classification of pathogenic. However, for the sake of this example, we are just going to ignore this in order to focus on how to evaluate the case-level data in the event this gene had not already been curated by ClinGen dosage sensitivity. So pretend you don't see that, pretend that's not there. We'll move on to section three, which is the evaluation of gene number. Again, Decipher is a great place to quickly and easily find this information. Here we see this duplication involves only two protein coding genes, so we would apply category 3A, which is worth zero points, and continue our evaluation. Okay, so now we have arrived at section four, the focus of our time together today, the detailed evaluation of genomic content. So where shall we start? 
this case is pretty simple. There are only two genes in the CMV, and one of them is an omen morbid gene, LMNB1. The other isn't. So we'll start with LMNB1. This gene is associated with a condition called autosomal dominant leukodystrophy, or ADLD. So what is ADLD? Autosomal dominant leukodystrophy is a disorder that typically onsets in the fourth to fifth decade of life. The initial signs include symptoms of autonomic dysfunction, including bladder dysfunction and orthostatic hypotension. These are typically followed by motor and cerebellar impairments, including spasticity, ataxia, and tremor. Brain MRI reveals findings such as symmetric T2-weighted hypointensity within the cerebral white matter. This disorder can be misdiagnosed as multiple sclerosis, other forms of leukodystrophy, such as Alexander disease or adrenal leukodystrophy, um, spinocerebellar ataxia, et cetera. Um, but the penetrance is believed to be 100%. So when I start my literature search with the very wide LMNB1, I get back 115 results which is likely too many for anyone to go through in one sitting. So from my quick review of OMIM, I know that duplications of this gene have been associated with disease. So I'm gonna amend my search to LMNB1 duplication and check the filter on the left for humans. This isn't to say I would never be interested in non-human literature. Could be a valuable source of functional data if I'm looking for that kind of thing later. But at first, I'd just like to get a sense of the human probands that have been reported with variation in this gene and disease. Once I do that, I'm met with a more manageable 24 articles. Do I necessarily need to read each and every one of these articles? No. Um, if I'm able to collect enough evidence to support pathogenicity from a few key articles, I'm not obligated to look at every single one. However, I most likely will look through each of the titles and the abstracts just to make sure I'm not overlooking something important. I'm looking through this list of articles with potential information, and I noticed that this one paper, Giorgio et al., 2013, is not the most recent paper available, but it does claim to have the largest collection of ADLD family study to date, which is typically a good starting point, so I will start there. In this paper, the authors studied 31 individuals from 20 families around the world. This type of information is interesting as it indicates that disease-causing variants have been identified in families across different ethnic groups who are unlikely to be related to one another. The authors tell you that nine of the individuals have been reported previously. That's good information to pay attention to, so you do not inadvertently double count literature cases. The authors also state that even though samples from these individuals were reanalyzed in their own lab for the purposes of defining the boundaries of the duplications, each individual had previously had an LMNB1 duplication identified in different labs through various methods. This is also of interest because it lessens the concern that the variants identified could actually be mistakes or artifacts of the single testing platform used in a single laboratory. No comment was made on any other testing the individuals may have had to rule out other genetic causes of leukodystrophy. This figure from the paper is showing each of the unique duplications identified. The red stars mark the nine cases that have been published previously, and I've added a schematic of our case, case W, to the bottom to give you a sense of what our CMV involves compared to those. You can see that our case is very similar in genomic content to several of those reported here. Any of those, um, with a possible conservative exception of the yellow case, BR1, is that one's larger and involves other genes, could be considered possible supporting evidence for our case. Note that this paper does not provide detailed information on the structure of the families and who was tested, making it difficult to ascertain whether or not any segregation information could be counted. To look for this information, let's go back to the original sources for some of these previously reported variants. At a minimum, you can consider counting the six previously unpublished cases here, uh, published cases here using category 4E, inheritance unknown, as we truly don't know accurate inheritance information for these cases. Going back to the original source for some of the cases in Giorgio brings us to Schuster et al. 2011, four of the Giorgio cases were originally described here. These are four non-related families with ADLD and autonomic symptoms. Samples from only one affected individual from each family were analyzed by genome-wide SNP array with the results shown in black on the right. Again, I've added in the schematic of our case, case W, for your reference. 
In this study, the authors did some additional Western blot analyses of LAMMB1 on five affected individuals from the two Swedish families, including both probands. These studies showed significant increases in the LAMMB1 protein levels, um, but levels of MARCH3, which is the gene, this, oops, I thought I could move my mouse, this gene right here, which is frequently partially involved in some of these duplications, the levels of uh, MARCH3 mRNA um, was similar between patients and controls. Here I'm showing you the pedigrees from the four families. Remember, even though each family has several affected members, testing was only performed on one individual per family as marked by the red star. Technically, we can't count segregation for any of these families because we don't know if any of them, aside from the probands, carry the variant. Within family SC1, the authors did do Western blot to measure LMNB1 protein levels on a few additional family members, and they were consistent with the results of the two known genotype positive individuals, one from their own family and one from a different family. And that's uh, the blue circle. We could infer that those people are also genotype positive, but I would recommend against using inferred information, particularly if other potentially useful information is still available. So for now, we know we have at least four genotype positive, phenotype positive individuals from different families from this paper, but let's see what else we can find out. So here's another original paper for a family also described in Giorgio. In this family, the 47-year-old male proband presented with symptoms consistent with ADLD and brain MRI demonstrated findings consistent with leukodystrophy. He was found to have a duplication involving LMNB1 represented by the highlighted blue area with the red bracket in the browser screenshot at the bottom of the page. His initially asymptomatic sister also carried the duplication, but on subsequent brain MRI, she was found to have features consistent with leukodystrophy. Here's another case series from 2006 describing three duplications involving LMNB1 from four different families affected with ADLD. This study was also able to demonstrate increased LMNB1 expression in brain tissue from affected individuals and found no difference in March 3 expression. The authors also overexpressed LMNB1 in flies, resulting in a degenerative phenotype. However, this paper also does not specify who was tested in each family or which individuals are known to have the duplication. Finally, this paper from 2013 shows a Serbian family presenting with features consistent with ADLD and a duplication involving LMNB1. Two first cousins were shown to be genotype positive, phenotype positive. So at this point, even looking at just those few papers, we have a wealth of information supporting the relationship between duplications of LMNB1 and autosomal dominant leukodystrophy. We've got duplications in at least 15 probands with ADLD with more available in the literature. We also have functional evidence showing that increased lemon expression in the leukocytes and brain tissue of affected individuals, but normal levels of March 3, that nearby gene that's also frequently partially included. Overexpression in flies causes a degenerative phenotype. However, the evidence we have doesn't neatly fit our scoring rules. For one, even though we have a number of large families, testing was consistently done, testing was inconsistently done on affected family members, and we can only demonstrate genotype positive, phenotype positive status for segregation counting purposes in a few individuals. We don't have any de novo cases, so we can't use that scoring category. Um, and with the evidence we have, we're running into the category maximums put in place in the scoring metrics. So the category maximums, and you can notice they are here, um, these were put in place in order to prevent certain types of evidence from taking a case all the way to pathogenic on their own without other supportive information. The goal with this is to encourage the collection of diverse pieces of information if such information exists. In some cases, however, this is just not gonna be possible and you should carefully consider if your situation warrants an override of a category maximum. So here's an example of what the category maximums are trying to avoid. Um, so if segregation scoring were allowed to go all the way up to one point, a single large family with multiple genotype positive, phenotype positive individuals could drive a classification to pathogenic on its own. 
this would be inappropriate because segregation is an indirect piece of information and implicates a locus, but not necessarily a particular variant. We want the classification, you know, should be based on as much direct evidence from as many sources as possible, and if possible, to not be driven by a single family. With this in mind, let's go back to what we have for our case. Again, we've got at least 15 different probands, all with positive family history, with some documentable segregation, as well as supportive functional data. Because our phenotype is adult onset and doesn't appear to impact reproductive fitness, we've got large families with numerous affected individuals, but no documented de novo cases. So that category can't be used in this case. Achieving a variety of genetic evidence is just not possible here. This is a well-studied gene disease relationship with extensive evidence, and this is a good example of when it would be appropriate to override category maximums. So counting up the segregations we do have in the two families where we have more than one genotype positive phenotype individual, we have one from Dos Santos et al. and four from Podic et al. Once we count the intervening obligate carriers between the two genotype positive phenotype positive cousins. This gives us a total of five documented segregations for a total of 0 0.3 points. What do we do with the rest of the cases? A conservative approach would be to score them at 0 0.1 points each, our lowest score. This is the same number of points assigned to the assumed de novo cases with non-specific phenotype, category 4C, as well as cases with specific phenotype but unknown inheritance, category 4E. This is an appropriate solution as opposed to counting additional segregations because here we're letting the number of independent observations drive the classification, not just the fact that it appeared to segregate in a couple of large families. The specificity of this phenotype, the large amount of genetic evidence, and the support of functional evidence can all serve as rationale for this scoring change. Where does our patient fit into this? Remember, our case was an adult male referred for gait ataxia with a positive family history. While this is certainly very consistent with the expected presentation of ADLD, it's not specific to ADLD. A quick search for gait abnormalities among OMIM clinical synopses returns over 1,000 matches. Because of this, you might consider scoring with category 5G or the non-specific but consistent phenotype category. However, if when you call the ordering physician to discuss the case, they reveal to you that the patient has since had an MRI with findings consistent of leukodystrophy, a much more specific phenotype, you could consider upgrading this to category 5H up to 0.3 points. In summary, this duplication is pathogenic. Evidence supporting pathogenic pathogenicity includes functional data, numerous probands with similar duplications and diagnoses of ADLD with more available in the literature, at least two families with documented segregation of the duplication among affected family members, and a patient with features consistent with what has previously been reported. Um, so with that, that is all I have. I believe we do have a few short minutes for questions. Erica, if you would like to read me any good ones, we can get started. Okay, um, so here's the first one. Um, it's about clarification of the use of um, single nucleotide variant, variant, loss of function, sequence level um, mutations for classification of CNBs. Um, so the comment is, um, seeing loss of function variants in a gene doesn't necessarily mean that a full gene deletion um, will lead to the same phenotype. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, the evidence that we require for evaluating sequence, sequence level mutations that um, may confer a loss of function? And I'll also just bring up that um, our talk next week by Danny Pineda Alvarez is actually going to um, cover this topic in more detail. So Erin, I don't know if you have anything uh, additional you'd like to say about counting. Yes sequence level variant. Yes, good point. Um, as Erica mentioned, we will be talking about intragenic variants in more detail next week. But I think in general, regardless of whatever variants you're counting, the key here is phenotypic consistency. I'm trying to go back to screenshot of, well, it's going to take me a while. Anyway, the screenshot of the directions for this category the phenotype needs to be consistent. If it's not consistent, if you're seeing disparate phenotypes, um, then you should consider awarding zero or negative points, regardless of what type of variant you're looking at. Okay. 
And I would also add that it, uh, it also has to do with the specificity. So you want it to be consistent, but also if it is, as she has here on the bottom right side, if it's not highly specific, if it's um, you know, associated with the phenotype, such as developmental delay, autism, intellectual disability, we generally don't, um, don't give those as many points. Um, okay, the next question is, um, and I think this is referring to your example case towards the beginning of the talk when you talked about um, the evidence for haploinsufficiency for a gene in two ClinGen databases. Um, it seems that the dose of sensitivity map hadn't reviewed the gene, but the other database had. So can you just talk a little bit about um, the the different yes. sources of information that you can get from the Yes, app. this is one of my very favorite things to talk about. <laughs> so what I'm actually showing you, I think this is probably the slide that you are referring to. I'll make it bigger so people can see it. Um, you'll notice that the type of curation this is is gene disease validity, um, as opposed to our curation act or the one that we use most often, dosage sensitivity. And the difference between the two, gene disease validity is just asking the question, what is the evidence that this gene, regardless of the mechanism, causes this disease? Whereas dosage sensitivity is asking the question, does loss or gain of this gene cause disease? It's a very mechanism-specific question. So while they are related, they are not the same thing. It's not unusual for um, things to be evaluated for, by dosage, but not by gene curation or vice versa. And it's also not necessarily unusual if you see that um, dosage had called something a score of zero, no evidence, but gene curation called it definitive. That could be because the mechanism is something like gain of function or dominant negative um, that would not be applicable for the dosage evaluation. Um, so when you go to the clinicalgenome.org website, um, pay attention to which curation activity it is. This particular example only has one uh, result of that I'm showing, but if there were multiple curation activities had looked at a gene, you would see them all listed there together. Okay, great. Um, just a quick comment that one of the attendees made about search performing searches. They, you had a, a variety of options for how you search by cytoband. Um, they also said um, they, it may be beneficial to search by gene name and the word array. Um, so obviously yep. there's lots of ways to pull in the literature. Absolutely. There are plenty more valid search options than ones I've listed here. So if people want to share their favorites, that would be great too. And then I wanted to um, just come back to one that I tried to answer offline here about um, counting the um, counting individuals in segregation. Because I think this has come up um, in the past. So, um, as you mentioned, we only count the um, positive, the individuals who are both genotype and phenotype positive and obligate, obligate carriers. Um, so, they just wanted a little bit of further clarification of um, both like why we chose the gene disease validity process. And if you happen to have any information, Erin, um, since you were a co author on that paper about like, the rationales for that. Um, I, I provided some information from our supplemental data in the response. So um, this is a topic that if we can't clarify it today, we can try to um, touch on this a little bit later in this series. Um, but obviously going back to the primary source of the literature may be helpful um, for those who want to better understand um, this, uh, the segregation data. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the quickest, easiest answer is that, I mean, obviously there are way more sophisticated ways to come to assess segregation. There are calculations that can be done, but we wanted to pick something that was relatively simple um, and that could be done without the use of sophisticated calculators that you could do easily in your head. And choosing to count only the genotype positive, phenotype positive individuals would be the most conservative way to go. Again, there are calculators that will account for, um, you know, genotype positive, phenotype negative people or vice versa to kind of come up again with a more sophisticated answer. But given that not everyone has access to those, 
it's just easiest and most conservative um, to do it this way. And again, Erica was mentioning that this is consistent with our gene curation process. And I will pull over the ClinGen website to show you where you can find more information about that. If you go under curation activities, gene disease validity, our training materials, um, this is documented in more detail here in our standard operating procedures. If you do take the time to look at that document, you will notice a lot of similarities between this procedure and several things that I've mentioned here in relation to these guidelines, and this is intentional. We're just trying to um, move towards consistencies where we can in all of our various ClinGen evaluation processes. Okay, great. Thanks, Erin. And, you know, we only have a minute left, so I just want to say that um, the, the questions that are coming through on the Q&A are very good. Um, I hope that, you know, we're, we're trying to do our best job um, answering these and referring uh, you all back to the source data, which is our manuscript. I'd also like to remind everybody that we have a lot of really useful supplemental material that we try to put in there, and so we'll try to again, highlight where information is that, um, that you can go to as you're working through the, the metric. So um, anything that we've seen across multiple um, webinars here in terms of topics, we will um, do our best to try to cover as we work through this um, series. So thank you yeah, again certainly. For, for all your great questions, everybody. Yes, and I would just add, you know, of course, we're having our Q&A section on March the 12th, but, you know, if we see the same question coming up over and over again, or something that could lend itself to its own webinar, we could think about, you know, extending the series or doing this again every once in a while beyond, you know, what was originally posted. We might ask you a survey question in the future if you'd be interested in something like that, but we could certainly um, do it if there was interest. So with that, thank you guys very much and we will talk again next week.